Jeff Litke. What do you say about Jeff? <laughs> he is a native of Houston, Texas. Uh, he is from this congregation. One thing I guess we can say, Jeff, you've got good parents. So we'll just introduce him and say, he's got good parents, come speak to us. <laughs> uh, I do have a uh, fine father and mother. As a matter of fact, your mother's just about adopted my children since we've moved here. Uh, since yours are not here close, she takes care of mine a lot. I do appreciate that as well. <laughs> he is a 2001 graduate of the Spring Bible Institute. He does have a wife. And he has three children. In fact, I notice you do have a teenage daughter. I feel for you. I have one as well right behind you. <laughs> Jeff has preached in several congregations in Carlsbad, New Mexico, Stephenville, Texas, and presently works at the De Leon Congregation in De Leon, Texas. Uh, he will be speaking with us today on the subject of causes of division. Come speak to us, Jeff. I'm glad to be here. I came to school here at the Spring Bible Institute. When I came here, it was Houston College of the Bible. And uh, I'm thankful for that work and what it did for me, thanks to the elders here and members who supported it, and David for his work with it, and other teachers involved with it. The Spring Bible Institute, kind of an awkward name. It was Houston College of the Bible at first, and they had to change the name. And uh, David wanted to call it uh, Spring School of Preaching, and they taught us, they tried to teach us how to preach. And uh, they didn't teach us how to lecture, so we're going to preach today. Uh, but after David decided that, Daniel looked at Don and looked at me and uh, uh, said, David, we can't call it that. We're going to get in trouble if we don't have these guys institutionalized. So they called the Spring Bible Institute. That's fun. Maybe not entirely true, but it's fun. <laughs> Unity is the topic for this lectureship, and unity is based on the foundation of truth. There's no way around that. That is absolutely clearly what the scriptures teach. Our world today has so little regard for truth, it's almost absurd to have to say that. Uh, it's just like the fact that we breathe air. It is just a simple fact that you can see if you walk outside for two seconds back, you don't have to walk outside. Uh, just come back during the open forum and you'll understand what I mean. We don't care about truth as a culture and a society. To demonstrate that and how long it's been true, you can go back just a few years and see the presidential debates, particularly the ones between Dan Quayle and Al Gore, vice presidential debates, and notice how they were discussing the issue of abortion. And the basis upon which they were discussing that had very little to do with whether or not it was an actual life. And in the course of this, basically, Al Gore came up with the idea that, well, it's not personally what I believe, but we must uh, allow it for expediency's sake. And that idea, that kind of thinking, has infiltrated the church in a terrible way, and it has completely and totally destroyed unity in the church today. Yeah, well, we don't think that's right, but we need to do it for unity's sake or for expediency's sake, or we just didn't know what to do. And that's the way that many of the issues which are causing division work today. If we look at truth in the Bible, we find in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You can't have unity without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is truth. You cannot have unity without truth. And you can't divorce one from the other. In John 16 and verse 13, many people have much to say about how it is that the Spirit is what brings unity and the Spirit is what keeps division away. But Jesus says, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Truth is what the Spirit brought. And that's what guides us in the ways of unity. When truth is forsaken, guess what you will not have? Unity is gone. In John 17 and verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Well, you're not going to have a sanctified church if you don't have truth, 
And without that, you will not have unity because that's the basis of our fellowship with the Father, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Well, I might say, well, that there has been an abortion of truth in the church. And that's exactly what we're looking at. But not only that, there has been a miscarriage of love. Many of you, before I was ever a Christian or understood the gospel, were spending time in lectureships talking about the redefining of love that was taking a place taking place in the church. A redefinition of love, when in fact, in the Bible, it's very simple. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I don't know how people can misunderstand that so severely, but there was this redefining of love, and much of it had to do with an effort to extend the lines of fellowship and create a new idea of unity, which was, in fact, a unity and diversity. And let me put it this way. It was a unity in the face of division. Or rather, they would simply take division and retag it unity. That's not very loving at all, but that's what they were doing. Both truth and love are essential for unity. Look in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 4 and see what was written here. This chapter is on unity. And beginning in verse 2, he says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. If you drop on down to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, he says, talking about doctrines there, he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things. And then he goes on to talk about edification, which is in love, uh, down verse, through verse 16. If you don't have truth and you don't have love, you will be carried away with false doctrines. But where you have truth and you have love, you have the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and that keeps you in unity and keeps division at bay. That's what the New Testament teaches. It's important to know where unity comes from and able to, uh, to be able to identify division, too. In Philippians chapter 2, in verse 1, Paul would write to the church in Philippi, a church which was quite mature uh, despite its age, but apparently there was going to be a thread of division there. But he writes there about this mindset that they were to have, but he starts off in chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill you, my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one mind, and let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, that word strife there is sometimes translated factions. I did something very difficult. I pulled the vines off the shelf and looked up the word strife, and it tells you that uh, factions is a legitimate translation of that in certain contexts. And, and he goes on to talk about that party making. If Philippians chapter 2 has anything to do with unity, then it tells you that there is a prohibition about how to achieve it. The Lord set up his kingdom, his church, and it is not a party system whereby factions go around campaigning in order to change what the direction of the congregation is or to reorganize in certain ways. There is a prohibition against a party system for governing the church there and achieving unity. There's a prohibition there, a direct statement. Well, without truth and love, there can be no unity, only division. You have to look at things sometimes and understanding what's going on from Satan's perspective. I have people who come up to me who perhaps were uh, maybe only second generation away from the split in the church that happened uh, over 100 years ago. And they ask me, what is the major difference between the Church of Christ and the Christian church? And I ask them usually, well, what do you think the difference is? And they usually say, well, it's the piano. And I, I think that's, that's an absurd way. Why do they have the piano? Why, where do they get it? Why don't we have one? That's the real questions that you have to ask. 
We had a good lesson this morning about hermeneutics. The problem is they do not view the Bible as the authority to be followed in all things. They do not believe in direct statements. They do not believe, I don't even know that if they understand that implication is actually something that exists in reality. Uh, and then approved examples. They don't understand that. They don't believe it. They don't look at the scriptures as the authority. That's why they bring in the piano. The division was in place when they turned their hearts away from God's word. The piano, all it did is reveal it to the people around them. That's all that it did. The vision was already there. Satan is subtle. And when people said, well, you know what, if we get the piano out of the church, then we can have the church of Christ again. No, you have to get back to the attitude that says, let us do only what is authorized by the New Testament. And there has to be that change of mind and a focus on the truth of God's word and a love of that truth. Church history is a fun study. In fact, we're studying in our Wednesday night classes, and instead of just going through a timeline, what we're doing is we're looking at the doctrines that resurfaced over and over again, and we're looking at it in three different ways. Number one, what does this doctrine say about the nature of God? Number two, what does this doctrine or practice say about the nature of man? And number three, what does this doctrine or practice say about the nature of inspired scriptures? What does it say about those three things? And you notice they have the same problems over and over and over again. Well, that's the way Satan looks at things. And if he gets rid of the piano and he doesn't get rid of the attitude that I can have worship my way, then you're going to end up with problems, division over and over and over again. There is a certain kind of division that comes from God and is acceptable to God and demanded by God. And if you look, you can find that in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 where Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. When a person is at odds with God, the sword of the Spirit will point that out in a very pointed way. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Ephesians 6 and verse 17, we, you and I, are supposed to take the sword of the spirit and employ it in the work of being a faithful Christian. What that means is that there is going to be certain divisions that occur. In fact, Jesus himself said, he said, think not that I've come to bring peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What in the world did he mean by that? Well, he went on to describe it. He's going to bring a certain kind of division when people are not focused on truth. And that was not only acceptable to him, it was demanded by him. And there's no way around it. We can't be faithful. And if we do not divide from wickedness, God will divide himself from us. And I guarantee you that will be authorized when he does it. And he's not unloving when he does that. Division is something very serious. People will run around and say, peace, peace, let's just all get along. And that's like the prophets of old that Jeremiah addressed in Jeremiah chapter 6. But he was living in a society where the king would take the scriptures, he would take his own pen knife, and he would cut them to shreds and throw them in the fire. And that's what people are doing today. Now, they don't do it in exactly the same literal way, but by the way that they preach them, by the way that they treat them, their hermeneutical choices, that's exactly what's going on today. And without repentance, you cannot have unity. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, those people who heard the gospel preached, they were pricked in their heart. There was another group of people later on in Acts chapter 7, verse 54. They were cut to the heart. But in both places, you had the sword of the Spirit being employed, and you had reactions to it. One was correct and one was incorrect. But division took place. Some divided themselves from God. Some divided themselves from the prophets. Some divided themselves from the wickedness of this world and the corruption that had overtaken the Jewish nation. But division took place within all of them. God will divide. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 31 32, 
Jesus said, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. There will be a separation and division which is acceptable to God. You know, it's a funny thing. When I was going around looking for uh, looking at, up material on this topic of division, I found that when most people talked about division, many preachers talked about division, they didn't address division in the church, they addressed denominationalism. And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at the topic of division. When Paul wrote to churches, churches of Christ, because that's all there was then, and he wrote to churches of Christ and told them about division and clearing up division within the churches of Christ. And then there is this wholesale abandonment of looking at the church introspectively and said, that's where the division is, it's out there. Now, it's true that you have to address denominationalism and the divisive practices that they, that they observe. That's true, fine, and good. But to neglect the other is divisive itself. But denominationalism, maybe that assumes the idea not of the restoration principle, but of the restoration movement and the restoration heritage, which basically says the church is in existence out there, and if all of these denominations would drop their divisive practices without changing their mind, mind you, then we can have unity with them. Well, that's false. It doesn't work that way. But that's what they did. Names, organizations, Worship of denominations, all of those are divisive, in fact, and they must be dropped. Their creeds are divisive. We've got the Bible. It, uni it unifies. Creeds divide. All that's true. But these discussions seldom spend much time talking about the fact that God is holy. And because he's holy, he's not going to tolerate sin. He will divide himself from it, and if you don't divide yourself from it, then he will divide himself from you. And that's exactly why many people are going out and trying to practice evangelism without repentance. And that's part of why the church is having trouble today. They don't talk about the nature of the Bible. They just basically try to get people in the water. But then I'm also told by some people that most divisions are because of personality conflicts. I thought about that, and all that you read about in the New Testament concerning division, and there is a lot of material in there about division, but there's really two major times that you find division of a sort coming from personalities. One of those in Acts 15, 36 through 39, where Paul and Barnabas couldn't go on a trip together because of their choice of who they were going to take, and they split ways, and apparently later on they got back together, and uh, everything was okay. Now listen, some of you here may be Cowboys fans. I'll worship with you. I'm not going to go to the game with you. That's okay. And we can call that a division if we want to, but it does not disrupt the unity that is in Christ. And that's what you're looking at. Well, maybe not exactly, but you get the picture of what I'm talking about. The others in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, don't exactly know what was going on. Paul didn't see fit to mention exactly what it was, but when it was a doctrinal problem, he was seldom bashful about spelling it out precisely, exactly. And so I have my doubts as to whether or not it was an actual doctrinal problem there. But nevertheless, the fact is, if they would have the same mind in Christ, they could get along with one another, even if one of these ladies liked the cowboys. It didn't matter. Personalities as a cause of division in the New Testament is not an overriding theme in all the context concerning division. Why people try to make it, oh, it's just about personalities. They just got crossways in their personality. It's because they want to get along when God isn't getting along. That's what's going on. But there are something which we might refer to as divisions of attitudes. First off, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, you saw when the Lord commanded us to divide from certain individuals, the very next verse gives a certain kind of attitude and characterizes those individuals in their divisiveness, showing us that we must divide from them. Well, what kind of people? Well, Romans 16 and verse 18 says, For they are such, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they're not serving the Lord. He says, But their own belly... And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Do you remember Absalom and his mode of operation? He'd get there at the gate and he would catch people where all the traffic was. 
and he would people would come to him with their problems and it didn't matter what the problem was or where he stood on the issue oh yes I understand you're right you're right nobody's hearing your case and what you need to do is you need to go to the leaders and yell and scream and call for a change to be made and, and I think about that along with Romans 16 and verse 18 and I'm convinced there are certain preachers within the churches of Christ that have this little red phone in the closet in their office. It's kind of like the bat phone. And every time some member of the church gets disgruntled, that little phone in their closet rings. They pick it up and they explain very clearly how these disgruntled brethren can destroy the congregation they're in. And it's by following the behavior of Absalom because they know that this threatens their gospel meeting circuit from which they make their money. That goes on in the Lord's church today. I realize that there are some people who may not be well aware of that, but it does happen. I, I'm positive that it caused uh, much of the problem that, that happened in Huntsville at the Fish Hatchery Road congregation. I'm positive that it was much of the cause of what happened with the Buda Kyle congregation when they tried to warn the elders at the Southwest Church about the, uh, the apostasy that was taking place among their leaders. I'm positive that it destroyed the eldership at the beautiful congregation. This happens. And it happens because of an attitude, an attitude of self-service. And so they destroy the Lord's church serving their own bellies. I'm sure they're well spoken, but should that be any surprise? In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, we're told, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They are able to beguile the innocent. In Galatians chapter 1, 6 and 7, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And they're preaching another gospel. That's what these people were doing. And by the way, Paul wished that they would be cut off, accursed, that they'd be divided from. There needed to be a separation that took place because of the false gospel they preached. And the church was better off for it. Don't forget that. That church was better off for that. But then in chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? See, these people were deceived. The hearts of the simple were deceived. They were bewitched. And by the way, it's interesting to look at various translations on Galatians 3 and verse 1. Uh, some of those don't exhibit good Christian decorum. In fact, I think it was uh, the Williams translation which uh, called those Galatians idiots. And one of them said, uh, you stupid Galatians. And uh, so that's just sort of an interesting point. No extra charge for that, but uh, that's the way that uh, some decent scholars have translated that passage. But other division attitudes. How about those who are self-willed? In 3 John 9 and 10, you have Diotrephes. He chose that the congregation where he was did not need to be united with the apostles. In fact, he himself would not receive other brethren. It was that attitude of self-will that says, Here's the way that I'm going to have it. And the apostles were expected to write to him saying, may we come to you so he could say, you may come. Well, that's the way that they conducted themselves because they were self-willed. There are others who exhibited pride and jealousy. I think about Saul and David. Saul could have been united with David if he had a different attitude, but he was completely and totally bitter with his pride and his jealousy of David. He could have called him in and and been blessed by God for doing this and giving him a, uh, a proper training and things royal and cared for David and received blessings of God, but he chose not to do that. He chose to chase David around in the last years of his work as a king, and it didn't do him any good. That was pride and jealousy and bitterness. And if you don't believe that will cause division, just look at what happened between Saul and David. Well, then also, as we had mentioned up in the last hour, there's that that attitude of despair and self-pity. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, you have the, uh, 18 and 19 rather, you have the, the contest on Mount Carmel and Elijah went up there and did that great work and then he hears about Jezebel and later on he ends up all by himself under the juniper tree. Self-pity, despair, and there were 7,000 out there. They weren't at Mount Carmel, but they were faithful to God. And if he had been looking, he could have found them, I suppose. 
He could have prayed for that, but no, he didn't do that. He found himself out of pity and self-despair out there under the juniper tree. And it might be that some people here find themselves wanting to go sit under that juniper tree and say, Lord, take me now. But that's a divisive attitude. And it keeps us from one another. Well, then also, there are the problems in Corinth that happen with spiritual immaturity and carnality that bring strife and divisions and following men and institutions is what results from that carnality and immaturity. We had a, a, a lecture last hour on, uh, on uh, ignorance and how that destroys things, and so I won't go much more into that, but understand that it does, again, bring strife and divisions. You know, immorality. Immorality is something that brings divisions also. I don't need to give you modern, present-day examples. I'm sure that all of you can think of far too many. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5 shows you that there was the man who had his father's wife, and even the Gentiles looked down on this. You know what Paul's antidote for that was? He withdraw fellowship from that man. That's what needed to be done. It was causing division, and the amount of division it caused was only going to multiply, and thus he warned them in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a little leavens, leavens a whole lot. And so without the proper division, there would continue to be strife through improper division. And so that immorality had consequences that affected the congregation. That's why it has to be dealt with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the very next chapter, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. There are many people caught up in all kinds of immorality, some people love the world. In fact, we read about Demas in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. He was divided from Paul because of his love for this present world. You know, what's in this present world, it's not real good. In fact, John would write about it in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's what was in this present world that drew this man away from Paul. Don't be drawn away by what this world has to offer. It might look attractive at first, but the end of it is worthless. What we stand to gain in heaven is far better than anything that we can compare it to in this earth. We need to be warned against the errors in this world. There are works of the flesh that have to be turned away from. After speaking about that unity and the truth and love in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, he goes on in verse 17 to tell them, walk not as the other Gentiles walk. Don't continue in that walk that you had before. You know, in the vanity of their mind is what he was talking about, the way that they're walking. In verses 21 and following, he says, if so be that you, you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And you take that and you compare that, by the way, to the Lord's prayer about unity. Neither pray after these alone, but for all them that shall believe on me through their word about the apostles' word he's talking about. And so it is that following the apostles' doctrine will keep us from this wicked living. But going back to Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, he warns them about all that evil, about the, the dangers of immorality out of the mouth in Ephesians 4 and uh, 21 through 26, and anger, and uh, over in chapter 5 and verse 2, he tells them to walk in love. In verse 3, he warns them against fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. And, you know, this filthiness and foolishness. But then you go on down to Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 11, and he says there, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Immorality will cause division in the church. And we have to preach against it. You know, that's one of those negative sermons, but... It's a positive thing to go to heaven. That's what it will achieve if we preach against them, people follow it. So you figure out if it's negative or positive. There are doctrines which cause division. People do not like to hear that. But doctrines cause division. False doctrines cause the wrong kind of division. We've already seen Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. I'd like to read to you this comment from... Brother Ira Rice, he said, Perceiving I've divided 
those claiming to be Jesus' disciples have been in recent years, certain naive, perhaps well-meaning, but misguided souls have tried to characterize Christian unity as merely a, of spirit rather than of doctrine, citing Paul in Ephesians 4.3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. However, please note that this passage is not referring to the human spirit, but to God's Holy Spirit. In fact, reading on, we see that the very unity under discussion is both doctrinal as well as organic and spiritual. Read it. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And that came from our rise in the 1988 Bellevue lectures. He's correct about that, by the way. But 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Well, listen, if unity is just a matter of having a, a nice, sweet spirit and it has very little to do with doctrine, what's it matter? I mean, can't we have a good mix? I mean, you don't like to eat the same thing all the time. Let's just bring in all manner of doctrines. It does matter. And without that, there couldn't be unity in the churches that Timothy worked with. So he goes on in verse 18, he says, This charge I committed unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. They made shipwreck of the faith of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he gives a list of errors and, and practices and all kinds of things. And he says, any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, preaching against sin is preaching doctrine, by the way. That's something else. But here's the next step in verse 11. According to the glorious gospel, when you preach the gospel, you're preaching the doctrine. And when you're preaching the doctrine, you're preaching the gospel. And that completely annihilates this very concept of Shelleyite, Big F, and Little F fellowship, which is nothing more than catricide rehashed. There was, looking back at church history, there was the time when antheism tore the church to bits. You had the one cup doctrine. You had non-institutionalism and, and all that that meant in its time. You had the idea that it was wrong to eat in a church building. And you had how that tore the church apart on so many levels. But all of this stemmed from a lack of respect for how the Bible authorizes. Going back to the lesson we heard this morning on the new hermeneutic. Well, hermeneutics play an important part because it addresses, like we started off in the lesson, it addresses how we view God's revelation to man. That's what it addresses, and a failure to understand that will result in division every time. Well, other doctrines. We talked about crossroadism. I don't have to go into that. Liberalism is something which causes division. Now, they're going to come along and say it causes unity, but it doesn't. It causes division from God, and therefore it causes division among brethren. There's also a problem with what we talked about a little bit earlier with liberalism is some have chosen to define liberalism, now listen, not as loosing where God does not loose, but they have chosen to define liberalism by whether or not you use praise teams, whether or not you have women preachers, whether or not you teach the plan of salvation as is outlined in the New Testament. And that's why it is that any and every other practice can come in that is loosing where the Bible does not loose, and you're free to say, well, we're not practicing it like the liberals practice it. It's because of a disregard for biblical unity and the way that the Bible authorizes practices in the New Testament church. That's what it amounts to. In liberalism, we need to understand it the way the Bible teaches it. And it is all about how the Bible authorizes. That's what it's about. Doctrines on marriage, divorce, free marriage. Those will cause division. You know why? Because to fail to understand that simple doctrine, which you read about in Matthew chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, well, a failure to understand that will end one in adultery. And adultery is immorality. Immorality. 
And immorality causes division in the church. That's not hard to understand. You don't have to, to be a rocket scientist to understand. You go back and you find those people who believe Baal's doctrine or Billingley's doctrine, and they're trying to loose where the Bible doesn't loose and allow for people to marry in ways that God said they shouldn't be doing that. And the Bible says it's adultery, and that's the simple fact of the matter. I used to ask questions to people involved in this or saying that people could marry where uh, those marriages were not authorized by the Bible to try to figure out which exactly... Which exact doctrine do they believe that they're trying to justify their behavior with? And I found out that really they don't know. Doctrines on marriage, divorce, and marriage come in about 31 flavors. And basically it's just so you can have your cake and eat it too. And they don't really think much about the doctrine that's behind it. All they know is, here is what I want and I'm going to have it. So I quit doing that. I've taken my Bible and I've, I've handed them Matthew chapter 19. And I said, read that passage and what does that say about your situation? And you'd be shocked to see how many people in wrong marriages will tell you, well, that says I can't be married. And you say, well, what are you going to do about it? And they won't say anything. They'll get up, they'll walk out, they'll say, I'm going to have to think about that, and then they'll continue in their immorality. That's what happens. There are other doctrines that bind where God hasn't bound, and they basically say that individuals who God says has the right to marry, they say they can't. And they cite some sort of time frame that they have concocted in their mind or the specific order of events in this world that they have decided that this is the way it needs to be. And they, they write it in their Bible and they say, see, it's in the Bible. This is the way it has to be. And that's kind of like uh, in, in the old Blondie where uh, they sat down and, uh, what was his name, Dagwood or Durwood, I forgot. Uh, he, he said, um, we can't have this for dinner. And she says, well, why not? And he says, well, it's meatloaf night. And she says, really? He says, yeah, that's in the Bible. And she said, I didn't read that in the Bible. And he goes and gets his Bible. He says, see right here, I wrote it down. <laughs> marriage, divorce, and marriage, people misunderstand the simplicity of the Scriptures, and they divide the Lord's church. I see John is here. And he's going to divide me from the pulpit. So I have to skip ahead and point something out. Right here behind this pulpit several years ago, Ronnie Hayes stood and preached a sermon on the Lord's Church. And in the context of that sermon, he preached this acronym, N-O-W, as a way to identify the Lord's Church. Name, organization, and worship. And when somebody changes the name of the church, we scream and hoop and holler and make a big ruckus, and rightfully so. When somebody corrupts the worship of the church and they wheel in their pianos, we will not stand for it. And then somebody changes the organization of the church and we shrug our shoulders. Why does it have to be like that? The division that's in the church today is dealing with organization in a terrible way. There's a list of quotes here. B.J. Clark wrote, who, by the way, is not preaching in a local congregation, if I understand correctly. Uh, now he is a fundraiser for Gospel Broadcasting Network. Uh, but he says it would be more accurate to say that one of the first major apostasies that beset the Lord's church came in the area of church government. Keith Mosher joined in these concerns saying too many so-called Christians are changing the church's organization, worship, and even name for their own devices. Evangelistic overseers writing her on God's appointed elders. Bobby Liddell said, in addition, those leaning toward pragmatism are willing to accept whatever they think works while looking at the history of church organization is important, let us not forget the attitude which brought about the first step down the long road of part departure has brought so many to their doom. Brother Liddell continued describing how deceit and pride stand behind departures in the area of organization. Uh, events build up men rather than congregations rule in such circumstances. He goes on to say, through the ensuing years following the restoration, men in the eldership have relinquished the oversight of the local congregation to embrace various substitutions. The false doctrines of, now watch it, majority rule, congregational democracy, giving each member and sometimes even non-members a vote, evangelistic oversight, where the preacher becomes more like the denominational pastor, or one-man rule, like a modern-day diatrophies. 
please some, but not God. These men were correct when they said those things. They were correct when they said those things. And I'm concerned about it, but not so concerned about what Brown Show practice. Hear me out. I'm not nearly concerned about what Brown Trail practiced as I am the premises upon which their practice was based in the sermon preached by Dave Miller in April of 1990. I called Dave Miller on the telephone and I asked him, I said, is the transcript contained in Contending for the Faith actually what you preached? Uh, I read Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 4 and realized the Bible teaches us about subtlety, and I know that Satan is subtle, so I figured I'd ask that question first uh, because you know how things work. He said, yes, that is what I preached. So it's correct. You've got the transcript down. That's what, that's what he preached. Nobody misrepresented him. That's what he said. He was not misrepresented by his own sermon. He did not misrepresent himself. He assured me of that. Second thing I asked him, I asked him if he had repented of it. He said, well, there wasn't anything wrong with it. Why should I repent of it? Several preachers in the area where I preached sent me an email, and the subject header of that email was the repentance of Dave Miller, and they had attached a statement from Dave Miller outlining his view on what was hap what happened at Brown Trail. And they said that this was a letter of repentance. And Dave Miller said there was nothing wrong in the sermon he didn't repent. I said, if somebody said that your letter was a statement of repentance, would you say that they, that they misrepresented you? He said, yes, absolutely. He said, I could send you a copy of that statement if you'd like. I said, I'd like that very much. And I got that, that statement sent by him, what was identical to the one I sent before, except in one regard, it had a copyright on the bottom. <laughs> And so everybody who sent me that copy, the first copy, and said it was a statement of repentance, I sent them Dave Miller's copy with the copyright on them, and I wrote a note to that that said, anybody who has altered Dave Miller's statement to have it be a statement of repentance is violating copyright law, misrepresenting Brother Miller, and that's wrong, and they need to repent of it. And then when we, maybe we could start to have unity in the church. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. Al Gore gets on his great big airplane and burns a lot of petrol, flying from coast to coast, giving lectures on how to save the environment. And our brethren get on great big airplanes and travel around coast to coast, preaching on the mainstreamers, preaching on how to achieve unity. And Al Gore has no more interest in preserving the environment than these mainstreamers have in preserving unity according to the Bible. Amen. Thank you.